In this video, you're gonna see where I spent my time today setting priorities for my whole company, setting priorities for my executive team, my executive leadership team meeting, and then a spontaneous pop-up business masterclass that came out of nowhere that I did not plan. So make sure you watch the entire video from start to finish if you don't wanna miss out on tens of thousands of dollars of gems. So it's Monday morning and I just got clear on all of my priorities for the week because I like to keep an open calendar. I just went over to Jen, my executive assistant, and basically said, drop everything. We're going to do a strategy session. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Ready? Check it out. I'm going to come to the window. You hear Bill? No. <laughs> Heard that. Yay. That's a really awesome noise. All right, let's go. So what we're about to do right now is clarify and identify the whole company's objectives. What are the goals of the overall company? And then we're gonna compare that to what everyone's focused on this week on my executive team and my leadership team. And we're gonna see are the company's priorities actually being lived and breathed by the team or is the team focused on low value action items which then we're gonna have to reorganize where people are spending their time so we're gonna whiteboard all this stuff out I started some whiteboarding up here with the help of Jade I was on a call last week with my executive coach um, and because my tendency is to go and I think you can attest to this from the last couple of weeks to go into the weeds on things. Yes. So like the last three weeks of my life have been focused on this finance project that we did. Um, and the weeks before that were focused on a product deep dive that I did to try to improve um, areas in which we're providing results for our clients. So I kind of go into these binges and what happens when I go into these binges is things inevitably get off track in other areas because I am I dive into this one area and then these other areas get off track. So what I basically have to do, like call it three times a quarter, maybe about once a month, is realign priorities to make sure that everyone's rowing in the same direction. So that basically means everyone knows what the top three or hopefully one priority is. I mean, it's hard, it's a lot easier to have three priorities, it's a lot harder to have one. So I have to be ruthless as the leader of our company in telling us what is that number one priority. Even though we have a highly capable team, inevitably people are gonna spend time in the things that they believe are gonna have the biggest immediate impact most, most of the time. That means that people get focused on short-sighted action items, putting out immediate fires, you know, producing an immediate result, but that's being focused on the trees, not the forest. So my job is to be the forest whisperer, um, to basically remind everyone, hey, here's the forest we're in, and we chose this forest, not this forest or this forest over here, we chose this forest, and here's why, and here's why we would re-choose this forest. Here's your niche. Here is your part of the rainforest. You're in charge of the mountain range, and here's how the mountain range should work, and here's how a mountain range should be, so that everyone isn't stepping on each other's toes. But I feel anxious about this right now. And it's because in me focusing on this big, big picture realignment of the company's priorities, I'm actually saying no to immediate things I could be doing. But instead, I'm deciding to be the priority engineer of the company, um, which means I'm not really doing any here and now work. What I am doing is making sure everyone else's work is pointed in the right direction. That's what we're gonna do on this trusty dusty whiteboard. Part of the way that we're operationalizing our new driver model is we're basically um, taking what our projections are and we're comparing them to actuals. Now that we have clear projections by month, we're basically reconciling, looking at what we projected to do versus what our actuals were and then identifying discrepancies. And then that's where this finance and data review document and process came from. So our, our goal is to do this every single month um, so that we're looking at 
okay, we said we were gonna sign up this many new clients in our projection, we only signed up this many. We said we were gonna lose this many clients max, we, we actually had this many clients taken off the books. We said we were gonna collect this much, we only collected this much, etc. And then that allows us to kind of become root cause engineers as to like what's causing these things, right? So what I broke down were the areas that were most uh, off track from the plan. It's something that I think all of us can make massive impacts with our teams, myself included, by just pushing rapid learning and change. You know what's so funny is like everyone thinks, I, I feel like the fantasy of entrepreneurship is great entrepreneurs live this lavish lifestyle and I'm in a conference room creating Excel documents and it's crazy, it doesn't feel like work because it's like, it's uh, this is the boring stuff that drives companies, you know? This is the important stuff. Here's what we did. We basically have priorities for every section of the company, company-wide priorities, agency priorities, coaching priorities, sales, Basically, what Jen and I did was uh, we went through all of our company-wide priorities from our annual planning meeting. Then we got every person on the leadership team to submit to me what they thought their top priorities are. We basically compared what they told me their priorities are with what the company's priorities are. We're going to try to basically reset everyone's responsibilities so that they're more in line with what the company needs rather than necessarily where they're currently spending time. Now, most of the team was actually pretty pretty on track. So I, I was surprised because of how hard they work. It's easy, for, it's easy for the team to get focused on very zoomed in things, but they actually were focused on pretty high value stuff. Not that I'm surprised because I doubted them. I'm just surprised because of how hard they work and they still are focused on the right things. Who is that? Oh, what's up, man? I heard the dog, so I what's up? Wanna come in? How things been? Things are tough. Okay. Not gonna lie. Okay. Um, I didn't listen to one thing that you said to me, and I'm kicking myself in the ass. For it. We stopped advertising and we went to a different mode. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it really like- I knew it, you were gonna say that. So we realized our mistake and look, Hindsight's always 2020. You have to, you absolutely have to be able to make those mistakes and they're so ingrained in us now. It's like, this is what, this is what it is. And it's like that wisdom knowledge model. Mm. You can lear learn through wisdom, you can learn through knowledge, which one you want to learn from. Mm. And sometimes you have to go through it to be like, oh, okay. <laughs> Even though somebody tells you. What's your biggest challenge that you think I could brainstorm on with you? This is like accountability, right? So just getting in front of you and saying, I screwed up and I didn't listen to you That's and it funny, probably yeah. won't happen again is the biggest thing that you can help me with. It's just the fear of there's something I don't know. And then that, that, the, that fear of feeling like I don't know something is what causes me to read a lot of books because then it sharpens my productivity muscle and it makes, makes me focus on the right things. The book I read was talking about uh, it was a compilation of lessons from Bezos, Jobs, and Musk. And it was talking about how automation can't solve all problems. So this is the lesson. It was, it was a story about Elon uh, on the production floor of Tesla, right? And if you've ever seen like Tesla's um, offices, they basically have like, it's all conveyor belts and, and robots is basically their office with like, it, you know, it's all AI and, and process, right? Mm -hmm. So one day Elon walks into his uh, production place and basically says, we're uprooting every single robot that's not needed. We're uprooting every machine that's not needed. Anything a human can do faster, we're bringing real people in. I thought that was crazy because he's like a process genius. He's like an AI genius. He knows how to create all the technology for production, mm -hmm. but yet he's removing automation. And that, it was the only way that they got the 5,000 cars a week at Tesla is because they removed automation where it was over automated. What I think is interesting is like in sales, like people 
think that, oh, if I just, if I just get my email like newsletter drip sequence or my text message automations, no. if I just get those things dialed in, then people will respond to my ads and, and no. sign up and become clients. It's, it's actually people contacting them. And for us, the biggest shift is the sales team. Like we've actually removed automations from every part of our marketing and sales process because now like if someone buys a ticket to our event, if someone comes in and, and just downloads an ebook of ours, like a real human being contacting them yeah. outweighs every automation that we've tried. And we have a 11 person mark, like full-time in-house marketing team. So like we're actually able to split test these things and we're able to see like, did automation actually produce a better result? Or did a human being contacting the person produce a better result, right? It's a human being. And it's a human being. And it's because there's something about like text message follow-up when it's from a real cell phone versus from like one of those weird like 201-352 numbers, right? Yeah. Or like even when it's a local number, people know when it's an automated text versus a real text. And the way you do text follow-up makes people feel like it's a serious individualized message when they get multiple texts within the same thread, right? So if, if I say, hey, you downloaded this, and then the next day I text them in that same thread, that person then knows that's a real text when it's in the same thread, mm -hmm. right? Because most text blast software is they send a new text. And then there's some that send duplicate text within the same thread. But that had literally, that raised our sales response rate probably like, 60 or 70% mm -hmm. when we tested it, just having a real person text them because there's something that happens when someone knows it's like a real person texting them. And then the other thing is video text, sending a selfie form video. Yeah. And then the third one, yeah, the third one's a group text. The BDR on our team, okay. a closer on our team, and the prospect. And they'll send a three-way text, a group text. You can't do those through automation. And then when you compile all these together, you send them a video text, you send them a three-way text and you send them multiple texts within the same message thread, mm -hmm. your response rate's like 100%. Mm. Because all three of those factors show someone it's a legitimate text message. It's custom. Yeah. It, it literally is crazy, the response rate. Text message marketing is the holy grail. It's the holy grail of getting high response rates and personalization. Whenever someone downloads something, they're doing it for a reason. They have a problem. That's why they downloaded the thing. So the fact that they downloaded the thing is your reason for reaching out to them. Hey, I see you downloaded X. Let me ask, why did you download that? What problem are you looking to solve, right? Because it's never the thing. Yeah, it's, always it's the problem that caused them to download the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. really that's really like, it's kind of off-putting and they're it, like, it, it either, it puts them in the mode of, where am I in the buying process? Yeah. Are, are they willing to say that if they acknowledge they have a problem or yeah. are they willing to say that they don't have a problem? So instantly it recognizes that. And okay. What you're able to do when you ask a direct question like that is you're able to embed that to when you get them on the phone, right? So it, it all ties together. If they downloaded it to solve X problem and then you get them on the phone, you can basically exacerbate the problem and then ask them if they'd like to talk to a specialist to actually help them solve that problem, right? And then that's where you end up taking, that's what a BDR would do. They're responsible for turning the prospect into getting clear on their problem and then turning them over to a closer. And then the closer role is to then basically like you're handing off a baton, take the baton of the problem they had when they downloaded the thing and then help them solve the problem. Right? So it's all one choreographed thing. So even if someone buys an event ticket, why did you download? What, why did you buy a ticket to the event? Well, I bought the ticket because I wanted to double my firm's revenue. Awesome. Do you want to wait for two months to double your firm's revenue or would you rather get started now? Because the event's in two months. Oh, I'd rather get started right now. Awesome. I'd love to put you in touch with someone who can help you do that now rather than later. Does that sound all right? So now we've, we've compressed urgency. I wish every business did this, found a way to create free lead magnets, embed it in the sales follow-up, embed it into consultative sales. Cause it's like, it gives you permission to contact people. It's not cold calling. And you can even start the contact on, Hey, want to make sure you got your free X. You don't even have to start with the Y question. That could be your second or third question. Hey, I want to make sure, did you get X? By the way, 
is there anything else I can get for you? We have a whole tool of hundreds of resources in our online portal, happy to send you over something that would work best. Let me ask, what's your biggest problem right now? So now I'm gonna send you this free thing, but first I need to know what your big, biggest problem is so I can send you the free thing that's relevant to your biggest problem. It's reciprocity that is focused on the problem. Yeah. Oh, like tell me this, I'm gonna give you this in exchange so then they're more likely to give that product. So product market fit, this is the other, I think it's probably more important. People silently make decisions based on product market fit every single day. When people like quietly quit on things or stop buying things or cancel a subscription, whatever. Oftentimes, the big realization I've had recently is you get reactive in solving those problems. So how can I get better at handling an objection when a client wants to quit? That would be a reactive solution. Yeah. That assumes that I'm, I'm still gonna have an environment in the future where a lot of people will want to quit, let's say as an example. The higher value question is what's wrong with the framing and positioning of my offer, the pricing of my offer, what's included in my offer, what's causing people to want to quit? What, what upstream effect is causing people to not buy, causing people to stop buying, to not refer friends? And that's basically product market fit. So that's, that's either pricing strategy, positioning strategy, or value strategy. So pricing is, which is in relation to value. Everyone says charge more, right? I mean, that's like what most people say in like the high ticket consulting space, charge more money. That's not how billionaires do it. They find the sweet spot to where they trigger virality. They don't just charge more. Like when, like when Elon rolled out Tesla, was it the highest price car ever? No. No, but it was the top of his, he had to work from a certain price point down. Yeah. Because he needed to innovate and he had to charge more in the beginning on that one product. But like, I think, what was, but what that, was the first one? 120, 130? Yeah, but now they're like, what, 60 bucks, 60,000? $65,000 for like the lowest level one. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. he optimized around price to find product market fit for a cohort of the market, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon does not, everything on Amazon's site is not high ticket, most expensive. If you look at like companies that have really stood the test of time and went viral, it's not that they charge a lot, it's that they had product market fit. That's another like hard nut to crack is like, that would tie into like for your gym, like what's the location of the gym? What's the competitive landscape of the gym? Like what are the top 15 competitors within a 10 mile radius? Who's stealing wallet share? And that's like a, that's R&D. It's, it's called interactive R&D. It's this new concept I've been poking around. What we just talked about for a small business owner, what would be how I have to allocate my time on that? Or do you hire for that role? One of the biggest holes in our bucket yep. was not not getting enough leads in was actually following up with them with the the three-step process that would you hire for that and spend a little bit more money or for me to try to do that myself because remember i have to do the sales and i have to do the product and the sales so call it ceo time allocation all right so if you're reverse engineering from a goal from call it, I don't know, a million dollars a year, right? And the constituent parts of that is how many members would you need? Well, what's your average average per revenue per year per, me per member? Say 5,400. 5,400? Yeah. 185 customers, members, whatever we want to call it, 185. So focus number one is what I call your revenue equation. This is the number one focus. Now that's only if you're not at that goal. Once you get to a million, right, then your priorities change where that this is not number one. But if, if a million isn't being hit, then you need to get 185 customers or, and or, you need to optimize your average price. If 
if that was lower than 5,400, then you would have to optimize that up, yep. right? So your revenue equation is the number one focus. So then within that, where do you spend your time within the revenue equation? Well, you have obviously lead gen, then you have sales, and then you have revenue optimization. So those are three subsets. So then these three are then a dance, right? So some, some months you're gonna crush it on lead gen. Well, then that's not the problem. What does it go to? Sales. And then you'll dial in your sales, you'll take your attention off of lead gen, and then what becomes the problem? Lead gen. And then you hire a salesperson and they start dropping price because they're trying to get people in the door. And then revenue optimization becomes your problem, right? So this is real, these three are really like a dance. Because if, if you spend all of your time on lead gen and then don't have a phone and don't have a way for people to contact you, you're not going to get a return from lead gen. If you, don't, if you spend all of your time on sales, but you have nobody contacting you, like all of these, th all three must be working. So therefore it's a dance between all three, right? So then what, what this basically means is that from these three, it then goes into creative testing and problem solving, right? And if you operate only on 24 hour deadlines for everything, like you're going to be able to test a lot more things than a competitor. So if you're doing 24 hour tests, now it's never gonna be 24 hours. You're gonna end up running things for longer than 24 hours. But if you're operating with a 24 hour mindset where it's like, okay, instead of complaining about, I'm not getting leads from this source, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn every complaint I have about my lead generation into a creative test. And I'm gonna roll it out. I may run it for longer than 24 hours, but I'm gonna roll out this creative test in less than 24 hours time. Zero complaints are allowed. Every complaint about lead gen goes into a creative test that's rolled out in no longer than 24 hours. Then 24 hours, problems are gonna pop up, right? This didn't work. This didn't launch right. We didn't get the right leads here. We got unqualified leads. This, these people aren't responding to us. This didn't work, that didn't work, right? So then we go back to another creative test. All right, let's change the messaging of the ad, right? So then you basically dance between these two, creative testing and problem solving. Oh, the messaging's off. Oh, the, the initial form submission's off. Oh, this is off, right? And you dance between these two things until you finally get to the point where, okay, I feel like we have lead gen down, right? But sales is now the problem, right? So now we have to go through creative testing and problem solving on sales. So we're gonna test the intro script. We're gonna test our follow-up sequence via text message. We're gonna test this, right? But all in under 24 hours. You're gonna have so much intel, whereas what most people do is the opposite of this. Most people, they put, they put so much emphasis in like, they say like, we're gonna do this big launch, right? We're gonna get everything set up, right? We're gonna put all this prep into it, and then we're gonna launch it, right? We're gonna launch it, and then we're gonna not change it, and then we're gonna complain, and then we're gonna stop. <laughs> right? So we're gonna we're gonna put all this prep into it, make it perfect, then we're gonna launch it, then we're gonna not change it because we put so much prep into it, right? then we're gonna go, damn, this didn't work to my expectation, and then stop, right? But over here, you're, you're gonna, your big launch is a result of probably 60 tests. That is your big launch. Your big launch is 60 tests. The result of those 60 tests is, gonna, is basically where you create your innovative strategy is through the compilation of 60 tests, right? So time management one is like, how do you spend 50% of your working time on your revenue equation? Then there's the other thing, which is NPS and profit. So this is what I call your delivery equation. So revenue equation, 50%, delivery equation, 50%. 
So N NPS stands for Net Promoter Score. So you want your clients to rate you at least a 75 out of 100 in terms of client satisfaction. Sending them surveys every single month, asking them on a scale one to 10, how likely are you to recommend us to a friend, right? And then profit, I don't know, you know, everyone has different goals, but you at least want to be at 20%, even if you're scaling. Net profit. Right? Net profit, not yeah. gross. But you can have gross profit problems within net profit, right? Which, you know, I'd rather have a net profit problem than a gross profit problem. Because net profit is probably, you know, net profit is, you, you could just be spending a lot of money on marketing. So, I mean, it basically, if we look at profit as a breakdown, you have revenue minus COGS, cost of goods sold, that's your gross profit, minus sales and marketing, minus OPEX, right, equals net profit. So if you have a gross profit problem, meaning you're spending too much money to deliver on a client. So cost of goods sold basically means how much money does it cost for you to deliver service to a client who's already bought? That's cost of goods sold. Mm -hmm. A cost of goods sold problem usually means you have a business model problem, which yeah. is harder to solve, still completely solvable. Yeah. So if I'm spending, for example, if I'm, if I'm collecting $100 in revenue from a client, like let's say I'm a, let's say I sell drywall. I'm charging the client $100 for a piece of drywall and $99 I have to pay for the drywall yeah. and I'm receiving $1 gross prof profit for every you know, $100 I bring in. I have 1% gross profit business. That means I can't spend more than 1% on sales and marketing or OPEX yeah. and I'm still at break even. There's, there's a reverse engineering process here that requires to understand like, because it's okay to be at 0% profit if you're reinvesting in sales and marketing or you're reinvesting in R&D to create a world-class product. It's not okay to just have low profits into eternity with no strategic reason for it, right? But the most important one is net promoter score, which is what is your, what is your client happiness and evangelism score? 75 out of 100 is world-class. Like literally, if you look at a scale, if you go on Google and type in like, what is world-class client happiness? 75 net promoter score is like un almost unreachable. It's like so hard to get the 75, but it means you have evangelist clients. And that's on average? On uh, average. Acro across. Correct. So, okay. Yeah. So we're, our company right now, this quarter, we're at 90. Last quarter, we were at 70. So... It's a constant moving target though. We've had quarters where we're at 60, um, but it's very hard. So this is the key though, because if you can create raving fans. That's the golden ticket. What does raving fans create? More referrals. Word of mouth, right? Yep. Referral, retention, repeat, right? It's everything. It's the intangible, because then when you dump in stuff, it makes every, like when you dump in more money for marketing, it works you know, you're, that one person is going to bring in two, three other people that yep. you, you know, from a referral. Yeah. Like, you know that. That's free too. Yeah. So how do you create raving fans? Well, then you have to reverse engineer from that. So that basically means what is the core result a client wants? What do they want? Because ultimately product market fit, which creates raving fans, comes from it's so simple. Are you delivering what people want? Are you delivering what they bought? Right? So a huge uh, insight on this is like, there's, um, there was this GM, I forget who it was, who sold like 10 class packs. And the average person would only use five. And it was a bestseller. Everyone would buy the 10 class pack because of the price framing of it. But the average person would only use five. So while it was a bestseller for the revenue equation, it was also creating this silent, they weren't complaining, this silent churn. Clients were just evaporating into the abyss yeah. because they weren't using all of their debt, right? So when they reduced it to five and they kept it at the same price, so they're getting double the revenue per class but they're delivering on their promise and what they bought, they eliminated their churn problem.
So it actually had nothing to do with price. It had to do with giving the someone the core result, yeah. right? They wanted to, A, sign up for what they used, not for more classes than they used. They wanted to sign up for what they used, right? And they wanted to actually work out. Who would have thought, right? So core result in our business is they need to get great results from their marketing. They need, uh, so from their marketing, since we have a coaching business, they need to get results from their coaching. And then we measure that as they need personal ROI, they need business ROI, and they need team ROI, right? And that same thing applies to both. So if we can show a client that our marketing had an impact on their personal life, their business, and their team, is it, can you get someone a result and not have them value it or know they got the result from you? Yes. So then that's where it comes into reporting in our business. They need to know they got the result. They, you can't just get them the result and then assume they know the result came from you. And then the third is experience. Imagine they get the result, they know the result came from you, but they email you on a Monday and ask you to fix some tiny little thing on their website and you don't reply to them for four weeks, right? They're getting amazing results. They know they're getting results from you, but they feel unheard and uncared for, right? So these three things, results, reporting, and experience, are like the evergreen core results of our business, right? Now, within this, there's also price. So if I can only make a case that I got someone a million dollars in new revenue for their business, and I can prove it to them and I'm giving them a great experience, but I charge them a million dollars for it, why would they buy? Why would they pay me a million dollars to make a million dollars? They're making nothing, mm -hmm. right? So the price is in relation to the mix of these three things. And then the whole merge of this is product market fit. So product market fit is the merge of you reaching the core result that the client wants at the price point that they'll pay for. So the other 50% is on delivery equation, right? So tangibly, same thing happens here, creative testing and problem solving, right? But tangibly, where do you start with doing all these things? If you have a team of one, what is your revenue equation? You, right? You, it's the only person, right? If you have a team of three, you're still gonna spend at least around a third of your time on revenue equation, right? About. So you actually start doing the thing, doing the delivery, but in the process of being a mad scientist researcher, as you're delivering the service and as you're generating the revenue, you're coming up with the systems to replace yourself. So that's where documented processes come in. That's where when you hire people, you're, you're putting them through the 30-30-30 model, 30 days of shadowing you, 30 days, I call it audit and handhold, and then 30 days hands-free, right? So you're basically using systems and training to replace yourself. Literally, this is, this is the grand model. I mean, this is literally it. Anything outside of these things, this is the hard thing. This is the hardest thing in business is fire pops up over here. Employee wants to quit. Client's unhappy. Need to hop on this sales call. Need to go teach my own uh, fitness class. Uh, kid's sick. This happens, right? That's the biggest problem because... The only things that matter to your business growth, I actually call this the, the business growth time equation. The only five things that matter are these. That's it. Any moment you're not spending time on your gross revenue, Anytime you're not spending time on increasing your average fee per client or total collected revenue per client per year, not increasing your number of customers, which comes from your lead gen, your sales, your revenue optimization, you're not being a CEO, you're being a doer, right? You're being, a, you're being an employee of yourself, right? Anytime you're not focused on innovating a better service or generating a profitable business model, 
is a distraction from being a CEO, right? This is why most, I, I think most people don't scale their business is because they're, they're too in it. I always tell my lawyer clients this, just because you're a good lawyer does not guarantee that you're going to be a good business owner of legal services, two very different things. Just because you're a good practitioner of what you do does not guarantee that you're a good marketer, does not guarantee that you're a good hirer, does not guarantee that you're a good coach to your team, does not guarantee that you're a good salesperson, right? These skills, sales, marketing, leadership, hiring, are the skills of a CEO and business owner. These skills are the skills of a doer, of an employee. When people call themselves, I went into business for myself, what really they're saying is, I created a job for myself. I saw that video. Yeah, so. Yeah.